Sim racing is great. It allows you to race against your racing heroes or give you the opportunity to be your racing heroes. Whether that hero is from today or days gone by. But there is a slight problem. A GP Laps covered this in his recent video and I'll probably say the same things because, well, he's right. Sim racers know what they like. Put it this way, how many millions of hot laps of the Nordschleifer exist on YouTube that have been done in Assetto Corsa? GT3s at Spa have just become boring and there's enough Porsche Cup Leagues to keep you occupied forever. And the same goes for the portion of the sim racing community that likes classic content as well. For open wheelers, classic content tends to translate to the Lotus 49 or 1960s Formula 1 in general. It's F1's killer years as well as its golden age and who knows, maybe Grand Prix Legends had something to do with it. But for tin tops and when it comes to potentially adding classic tin tops to a sim, there's only ever one thing people want. Group C. Again, no clue as to why. Maybe it's because those cars from the early 80s are portrayed as being uncontrollable monsters that had so much power you had to really concentrate so you didn't crash. And in being able to control the Group C car or a 1960s Formula 1 car, you become a so-called real driver. But one thing Jake did point out in his video is that the word classic car is defined, at least here in the UK, as being any car that is older than 15 years old and with a value over £15,000. That's cars from the 21st century. But generally though, it's between 25 and 30 years old. So if you own a car built between 1996 and 1991, congratulations. Although that said, my dad's Rover 200 from 1996 probably isn't a classic car. If it's still on the road, that is. N477UNH was the reg plate, but it's probably scrapped now. However, there are still some enthusiasts out there that just love any kind of racing car from before 1970, and there are a multitude of mods available for the classic racing connoisseur out there. Just a few weeks ago, I covered Hitler's proposed Deutschland ring, even though I'd never actually drove it because, admittedly, those tracks are beyond my comprehension. There's also the mental Arvus track in Germany and 1950s style Formula 1 cars to go with it. There's also a pre-war Donington Park and just everything you would ever need to feel the wind in your moustache. For me, the earliest I go is sort of the mid-90s, particularly for Formula 1, where they've got enough downforce to be able to go quick, but still enough power to kill you if you're not you know, kind to them. But that's not to say that the older cars aren't fun. I mean, while overused, the Lotus 49 is a laugh. But what if you want to go another stage further? Not 21st century, so we're not looking at like the F2004 or GT1. Not the 90s, so not Super Touring or any of those things. Not even the 20s or the other pre-war stuff. What about if you don't even want the 20th century? Because now, in a set of Corsa, we can go back to the Victorian age. This is the world's first ever car the Benz. It's got a one litre single cylinder engine that produces a whopping two horsepower at 250 revolutions a minute, which at the time would have melted the faces off anybody driving it and causing fear amongst any locals walking on the same road as you. At least the prototype did, the production models only produce one horsepower depending on what source you read. But what's amazing about this car is that you don't drive it in the same way you would drive a Ford Fiesta. This thing only has one forward gear. It doesn't even have pedals. The throttle is a lever on the left hand side that you basically pulled back to go. You then pushed it in the middle position or so for like neutral and then pushed all the way forward to break or bring up the clutch or however they drove it, it's mad. And the steering with the front wheel was done using a tiller, much like the one found on a canal boat. Probably handles like one as well. Now normally in these videos I jump into the rig that's next to my computer and I drive this thing using a direct drive wheel and you know show off how it handles and how it sounds and stuff like that, but that would be boring. I'm going to go for full immersion here, so I'm going to drive this car the way it was designed. By effectively using a flight simulator setup. Alright then, so you join me at the famous Top Gear test track. I thought this would be a good test bed to show you how to actually get this thing moving. Uh, because it, it's quite difficult when you're not used to it. And you also notice that I'm not sat in the rig like I normally would be for this kind of thing. I've actually got my HOTAS set up here because this is the closest to how this thing would have actually driven. So the little uh, axis on the rear is the clutch. You can see that on the blue. 
If I pull back the joystick, I get brake. I've got two buttons for gear up and gear down. It's got a reverse gear, a neutral gear, and a like a forward gear. And then the actual throttle quadrant itself is the throttle. So what you do is you pull the clutch in, you put it into gear like you normally would. But what you then have to do is give it some gas to about there, and then slowly let out the clutch like that. And then you can just... It is like driving driving an aeroplane. And that is pretty much it. That is how you get this thing going. So, with that said, let's get it onto a proper road and go for a proper drive. So, for the driving section of this video, I've brought the bends to beautiful northeastern England here. Just try not to rev the, the engine a bit too much. It is about 130 years old at this point. But, oh, still a bit too much. I'm so used to Flight Simulator where you bring the throttle back to idle and then push it forward for more power as opposed to having it inverted as it is here. Ah, I will uh, do at least some smooth inputs with the tiller as well, but I am basically just sat on a bench. Uh, I would have to look down at my feet to, to see where where the, uh, the the tiller is and, and all of that stuff. But this is nice. You know, nice scenery. The chugga-chugger of the, uh, the two-stroke engine. It makes you wonder what life was like before the car came along and, and what the reaction must have been when they saw this. Because before it was horse-drawn carriage. I mean, the train had just been invented, so... Yeah, you, can, you can go by train to your destination if you could A, afford it, and B, if the place you were going to was served by train. At least here in the UK, virtually every village had a train station, and then in the sort of 50s and 60s, they all closed down. But imagine just being sat at home, and then hearing that noise. You'd be thinking, what the hell is that? And then this sort of self-propelled vehicle comes along that only the, the very, very rich could buy. I mean, in today's money, this car would cost, I think it's about $4,000, 4000 US dollars, which doesn't sound like a lot. But back then, it was an insane amount of money coming up to a bend here. See the chevrons pointing in the direction that the, the road goes. It's slightly uphill, but the, the car is doing okay. I can give it a bit more power. We can get up to a dizzy 8 miles an hour here. And it does look a bit weird being this high up and just driving. Just sat on a bench with no airbags, no seatbelt. At the time, it must have been... Oops, sorry. must have been terrifying. Tiller does get quite jerky at times, which is uh, a little bit annoying. Mainly for you, because you're the ones watching and you don't want to see jerky camera angles. I mean, I'd love to give this thing a go in real life. But to be able to drive this thing in a simulator on a free roam map like this, and one that looks as good as this, this is nice. It'll take you forever to get around the map. Give it a tiny bit more power. See if we can get up to 10 miles an hour, maybe. Because the road is starting to drop away here. Face full of tree. Bertha Benz actually went on a road trip with this thing, showing it off. And she she partially financed the car as well, which is uh, very nice of her. 
took her sons, uh, Eugene and Richard, who were sort of 15 and 14 years old at the time, left the, the family home in Mannheim, just went around showing people, and apparently the crowds were, were, were massive. They couldn't believe what they were seeing, and, you know, I don't blame them. Do we go down there? Nah, let's just keep on going. Get a bit more power. I seriously doubt this thing would get around the Nordschleife, though. It'd be interesting to see what travel times were by horse and cart at the time that this came out. So we're talking sort of 18, 1888. And I wonder if there were people at the time who said this will never take off. But the 20th century, I mean, this is the tail end of the, the 19th century. We're going into the 20th century. The car was mass produced because of Henry Ford. The aeroplane came around because of the, of the uh, Wright brothers. Then we had two world wars where technology just accelerated because we had the plane coming on leaps and bounds because of the First World War and then we got the jet engine in the Second World War and then because of the Cold War we went into space and then we we got computers and, and all that stuff and at the tail end of the 20th century the internet happened. So those hundred years or so between so 110 years between 1888 and 1998 incredible and this is basically where it started I mean we had the industrial revolution with the factories but the real revolution in terms of making the world smaller came with this pretty much I'm just going to pull up to the side of the road. It's a little lay-by. I've driven long enough, but I'm hoping I'm giving you some food for thought here and sort of giving you an idea as to what this car must have been like. Because there's some other thinking points as well that I should really talk about. So imagine then, this new mode of transportation coming into your town in the late 1800s, and you don't know what this thing is or where it's going to go. Will it ever catch on? Will I ever be able to afford one? And all of that stuff. But imagine going back to that time and saying to Carl Benz that within 20 years there will be a facility in Britain specifically designed for racing these things. And within 70 years there will be a world championship for racing cars. Would you then tell him that in 1955 a car bearing his own name would cause unparalleled destruction at a race in France and almost get racing banned the world over? But then you tell him, 133 years from the day he unveiled his new invention, that cars with his name on them would be the most dominant team in that same world championship that was formed in the mid 20th century. Adding to that, the fact that in 2021 there are millions of his invention on the road, and in some cases, these vehicles can drive themselves. And while the original car could barely muster 10 miles an hour and people were terrified of the speeds that it will do, there are now roads in his native Germany where there are no speed limits and you can go as fast as you want. And not only did the speeds in racing get faster and faster until cars were doing 20 times the speed of the original Benz car, there are now road legal cars that will achieve over 250. And in 2021, a man will be able to crash into a wall at 180 miles an hour and walk away. And it all started with this.